I say this every time, but we really do need a countdown or something. Um, hello. Uh, <clears throat> should I start talking? Chandra, is anyone in yet? Let's see how this is going to work today. Let's see. No, it's out of focus. Um, well, so uh, you would think that after over a year of doing this, that the first Thursday of the month wouldn't creep up on me as much as it does. Um, I was picking my son up from school today, and he was trying to, to trick me by saying it was Wednesday, and I believed him. And he said, no, I'm just kidding. It's Thursday. Uh and then I realized, it was like, we have a salon tonight. Uh, and so when we were planning what we were going to talk about this month, um, I've been doing a lot with Kickstarter this month, uh, some consultation type things. I, I love the company. I love the platform, as everyone who knows me knows. And so it's always a privilege to get to speak to them uh, about what they're doing and ways that they can improve the experience for creators. Uh, they're very tuned into that, and I really appreciate everyone there. And so a thing that's happening this month is uh, a prompt called Witch Starter that was started by uh, the lovely Margot Gerber, I believe last year was the first one, in October. And so that so definitely go to Kickstarter, check out the Witch Starter prompt. We're going to be doing something launching the 17th. Um, but it made me think about how, you know, I, I'm definitely li living in a universe where every day is Halloween. Uh, and with our publishing, that it very much reflects that. And that's something that I was always attracted to, it's like when people say, well, what kind of art do you like? I did notice very young that it was less the style than the subject matter. And of course, you know, everything evolves and changes and there's different things, different days. But what I had just noticed when I was, I don't know, probably grammar school age, was that if it had mythological themes, I would be way into it. It didn't matter if it was a mosaic or an oil painting or even just a pencil sketch. Um, and when it came time to step into publishing, of course, we're deeply rooted in Art Nouveau, we're deeply rooted in symbolism, um, but something that does work into all of the narratives that we publish is the idea of, of thematic themes that support whatever the aesthetic is that we're specifically focusing on. And so the thing that I wanted to do tonight was kind of show a little bit um, of how some of the aesthetics of mysticism, the aesthetics that surround these kind of ideas and ideologies have changed over the centuries. Um, this is not going to be dissertation level. Uh, I'm just going to use a few of our books to kind of get really casually into the broader sense of, of what I've done as a, as a writer and a publisher, um, using our books as examples uh, of, of how you could explore this. Um, and so the, the first thing, and I, I'll, I'll be kind of light on these. So we do have, uh, if you, where's the focus plane right there? The Jugendstil books are shipping. Uh, these turned out beautifully. Uh, I'm so happy with these. Uh, a lot of people said they wanted it in hardback. But the problem is just cost. Um, and the German Art Nouveau movement is so important, and there's so much to share 
there that I didn't want to try to just encapsulate it into a small space. Um, there are so many artists and illustrators that are worth mentioning, worth sharing, that are important for people to know. Um, and the paperback editions are going to do that. It's, it's a little bigger than the ones we've done before, and I like it. It feels even more like it's a nice art book to me. But instead of flipping through this, I'm going to open uh, this PDF uh, to kind of start this. Um, Chandra, can you put that one in here somehow, maybe next to my face? Oh, there we go. Perfect. So with the Jugendstil book, um, one of the things, uh, there's not a lot in this book that would be decidedly psychedelic um, because this is really the first year of Art Nouveau in Germany. The thing that you do have is you've got these things that, I mean, look at, you've got this woman here and she's got a gown with these stars on it. So even though that's not mystical, like, you know, she listens to T-Rex. And then you've got this butterfly fairy woman. So you're getting kind of this bridge between classicism. Like here, look at this. Whoops, that's not going to work. These are going to be so low resolution on a stream. But <clears throat> the idea of mysticism, like all mysticism should be rooted in nature. Um, anything that isn't is an aberration. Like that's the point. The point is that, that magic mysticism is a, is a hack. It's, it's the back of the tapestry of, of life, of nature. And how do you pull those threads and weave them through? Well, so things like Jugendstil, it's completely peppered throughout. Uh, the ways that nature exists in mythology, like, of course, we've not seen nymphs and satyrs uh, at our neighborhood bus stop, at least not on a regular basis. And so that kind of subtlety, the subtle assumption that such things are common um, is, is a major element of mysticism and mystical thinking. Um, you know, this illustration is a great example of how it starts to move, whoops, sorry, move into Art Nouveau. You've got this figure where she's the branches and he's connected to the vinery. I mean, it's, again, that's all very, it's all very Art Nouveau. I'm kind of moving quickly through this just because I want to get to these other two. But my main point with this is just that the Jugendstil book definitely touches on the idea of, I mean, even to look at this, like, I mean, there's something very kind of Carlo Schwab, La Fleur de Mal about this. Um, and that's Otto Ekman, who was one of the most important proponents of German Art Nouveau. Oh, this is a great one. Uh, Phythia was, uh, this is the image that we used as the cover. The idea is that Apollo had slain a serpent and then it's when he killed it, the ground cracked open and he cast the corpse into there and the fumes coming off of it. Um, the Pythia, that was her title, <clears throat> would sit then on a stool and the fumes would then give her visions and she would relay the words of Apollo to the worshipers at the temple. What was her name? I'm not going to even try to pronounce that. Uh, and then there's a funny thing in this, which I'll show just because we're here. I mean, this is actually cool. Another little kind of mystical thing. But there's, uh, oh, this is another cool mystical one. The, uh, oh, it's not in this file because this is broken up. But there's a version of this where it has an art critic and he's sitting on a three-legged wooden stool and the fumes that are giving him visions are the fumes from his coffee cup. Uh, and it's just basically a satire of, of art critics. 
Um, but so that's Jugendstil. And let's close that window out, Chandra. Here, I think I could do it actually. Ooh, there we go. All right, so that's that's the Jugendstil book. And so, you know, kind of in a cursory sense, it's not directly related to like practical mysticism or anything like that. Um, but in terms of mythology and, and the natural connection to mysticism and spirituality, it's very present. Another one that's kind of a, a, an angled view, uh, this is another book that some of you may have coming your way. Where's my focus plane? Um, Beautiful Macabre. And I'm so, so thrilled to have this book. It's fine. I just have a narrow depth of field then. Um, so this, this book, we actually took a lot more than I'd expected to out. So if you have the paperback version, that's still great because there's a lot in there that's not in this one. So in addition to adding 16 pages to this one, there's also a lot that's been replaced. So the amount of new work in here is substantial. Um, we've got all these old paperback covers and I go into detail about, you know, look at these Italian pieces. Oh, these aren't in the old one. Lots of details. Uh, just, yeah, so there's, there's a lot in here. These were in the old one. Uh, th this one was, this one was not. I didn't have that at the time, actually. That was a later acquisition. Um, but so the reason I mentioned this in keeping with uh, tonight's subject is that one of the things that, that happened culturally in, um, oh, I don't even have it open. You gotta be kidding me. Well, all right, I'll just do it here. Um, you see a lot of mysticism in advertising. Uh, and I think that in the same way that you could say, oh, this uh, vacuum cleaner makes dust disappear or something. Um, like, let me find uh, I know what I'm looking like, you know, this is a, this is one that I used kind of in my little Facebook or Instagram story today, you know, like that's look at that for an ink ad. Um, and then you've got, I'm not going to flip. Oh, here, you know, you've got Joan of Arc and then that's a little different because that's the Buddha of good fortune for an art exhibition. But so beautiful macabre has a lot of, uh, a lot of things that uh, incorporate mystical thinking uh, into their advertisements. And so then the one that's really going to be the, the best thing to kind of illustrate this with is, of course, the one that's massive. Oh, my God, it's heavy. And then there's the uh, more reasonably scaled, whoa, more reasonably scaled, nine by 12 paperback. And so what I was gonna do with this was, was talk about when, when I used to show the Le Pater works, people didn't even really connect with him as Muka. They were used to his advertising art and the idea that things were more geometric. Um, a painter, Paul Laffley, is someone to look up is a really great modern example of this. But the idea that things are based more in geometry um, and uh, the idea kind <clears throat> the idea of hidden imagery like um, I mean, I'll just actually get in and show it. The point is people didn't connect with it. Uh, and I'm hoping that this book <clears throat> was a great way for people to be able to do that. Um, and so let me open this. So I'll open this one first, just to show um, 
So Chandra, let's pull this one in, please. So just to show an example of, of what I'm talking about, the things that people were less responsive to, oh, I'm not really finding, you know, I, I, I guess this kind of stuff, to, you know, some of the mandala pieces, which are in another, another file. Um, these books are so big and the image resolution and all of that, that we wind up having to send them in, in sections. Um, but, you know, there's a lot going on here. And if you're not interested in what the pomegranates represent or the lilies, um, you know, it might not resonate as much with you. There's the drawing for that great one. So these are in both the hardcover and soft cover. Uh, but so let's, I'm assuming that we know Alphonse Mucha. I'm assuming that... Perhaps foolishly, I'm assuming that most everyone watching this has the book. And so I'm just going to kind of go back to the, Chandra, can we pull that one in, please? Uh, I'm just going to go, go kind of back to the earliest bits of it. Um, where's the Invisible College? That's what I want. Aw, oh, man. Okay, hold on. Sorry about this. Um, why is it not here? Hold on, one, one forty, one to twenty six. Oh, that's why different folder. Okay, I apologize. Um, I'm going to open this one instead. So Chandra, can we, uh, do this one first? So yeah, put this one in please. So there's, uh, um, okay. So this is, this is a great example. When you see things like this in books, it all just feels very, very, very quaint. Um, and it's just kind of a medieval illustration. There's, there's often not a difference between our perception of seeing something like this or seeing like a Piranesi etching of ruins or something like that. Um, but when you're looking at these artworks, illustrations from this period, when I was mentioning the Mucha piece, and it's like, okay, there's the pomegranate and there's the lily, it was a very common thing in these early, like this is from 1611, to have an entire dialogue in the single image. So when we're talking about what are the aesthetics of mysticism, is it something like Jugendstil where there's a woman wrapped in a cloak of stars or is it something where there's a complete narrative of illumination and exploration? And I would argue that both arguments are valid. I think that the aesthetics of something like the Jugendstil illustrations grew out of this I think that a lot of artists take um, an easy way out if they're just doing something that's purely visual and there aren't necessarily clues in it, or at least the intention. Like things can be aesthetic and still be um, valid and valuable in the way that a, a, a you know a really great poem, like a love poem, uh, can be just as beautiful as something that's, uh, you know, dramatic and existential. Um, Chandra, let's pull this one in. And so then you start to, you know, when you, st okay, this is obviously all the sacred geometry things, but so then what happened for me is I started seeing things like this and just 
kind of looking at it, I think the way my dog looks at me when I'm talking too much. I think that it's not that I understood what was happening, but I just thought it was pretty. You know, you get down into these bottom parts and, you know, all of these stars and then the zodiac elements integrated and even just something as simple as these beautiful hand-drawn horizontal lines and the hand watercolor, it's all so beautiful. And one of the things that working on Le Pater really helped me to understand is how much, like a joke that I have with Gail Pataki is that English isn't her first language, art is. And so the idea that when you look at a painting of a fairy or a drawing of a witchy woman in a cloak, that you get a, a, a slight rush of that aesthetic and then your brain fills in the rest. Well, so the idea with this kind of sensibility is, well, what if the art stays ahead of your brain? What if there's so much there that when you fill the space, there's still room to continue. And of course, with great music, with great art, with all of it, we can take these journeys around a piece. What, you know, Heart of Gold by Neil Young means to one person in 1986 or someone else in 2009 or someone 30 years from now is going to be different. So we're not talking about like in a classical sense where you've completely understood he was using 10 gauge strings on a 19 whatever Martin or whatever. So we're not talking technically, but we are talking emotionally. And so the thing uh, that I would use as an example is, so if you're thinking about music, there are perhaps albums by a great artist that you might hear when you're younger and not be ready for. And I think that some, oh God, I can't remember the anecdote, but someone said something once about I think it was it had to do with Leonard Cohen, but something the idea was like some young person, and I'm gonna say it's Leonard Cohen, even though it might not be. But it was something where like someone was listening to that and said, "You know, I don't, I don't like it," and the person saying, "Yeah, well, it's okay because it's not for you yet." And the idea being that yeah, when you're when you're in high school. Uh, there's nothing wrong with listening to things that are based in virility and sexuality. And then certainly as you get older and your life changes, the interest in subject matter is going to change. Um, and it's not that we can't keep listening to, to certain things and nostalgia is powerful. But the point I'm trying to make is that you can find the edges of a poison album pretty easily. <laughs> you can find everything that that has to offer. And if there's more to it, it's your external elements bringing it in. So for example, maybe you're a sculptor and you're carving a really great, you know, framework or something, or carving around a framework and you're listening to something that's perhaps more shallow thematically, but you're bringing something to it. It's creating associations that wouldn't exist in the artwork unto itself separately. And so the thing that's interesting to me about Girano Bruno and Jakob Burma and Robert Flood, especially Robert Flood is amazing. People Google that name, Flood, F-L-U-D-D. He's fascinating. But the idea of, you know, the music of the spheres and celestial bodies correlating with notes and the ways that these things interact and the ways that it affects human behavior. When you're looking at artworks like this, there is information there. And it's not information like a textbook. I'm going to go back to this image 
the true principles of all things, just as an example of it can be aesthetically stimulating and then still have a lot of message to it. And you can't look at any of this kind of work and not end up looking at William Blake, um, you know, so loaded with meaning and also just beautiful, beautiful artworks. Um, you know, this is kind of a really nice page flip here. You've got Gustave Doré. Uh, I cannot say enough wonderful things about his work. But it's also very clear that this is more of an illustration because even though you've got some supernatural things happen here, it's still, you know, a guy in a robe holding a sword with a snake monster. As opposed to the Flammarion piece um, where the person is creeping beyond the realm of nature and into the heavens. You know, look, the machinery, the mechanisms of the universe. Um, and so this kind of thought, this is not illustrative. No one is suggesting that someone is poking their head through a membrane. Whereas here, they are suggesting that this celestial figure is coming down with a sword. So that's kind of another area where we're looking for what, are the, what is the line between the aesthetics of mysticism, between illustration and, um, you know, legitimately magical thinking. Um, the idea that we um, can be exploring realms beyond this physical one, I think that things like this are the entry point. I think every high school kid in the universe should have a book of Gustave Doré art. And there's nothing wrong with having it as an adult. I think my argument is, I think, if you want to be interested in the aesthetics of mysticism, you have to be looking at work like this. You have to be looking at work that takes the ideas further. The Salon Rosacroix is a great example of that. Like, it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful illustration. And I'm not going to, you know, read it in the book. I'm not going to go into it. But there's so much happening here that he's definitely ahead of a casual viewer. And in that way that I was talking about, um, it benefits us as art lovers to consider an artwork like this, to study it, and then catch up to where the artist was. I'll refer back to this one as being an example of someone that you could spend a lifetime on this and just still not get your head into all of it. That's why I didn't get too into this in the book because I'm just not qualified to, to discuss it in the way that I, I did feel qualified for Le Pater. Um, and uh, gosh, what else is in here? Lots of aesthetics. I mean, can't really show the two page spreads like that, but so that is, um, I guess we're done. It's 830. We got a half an hour. left. <laughs> so that was kind of the overview. I was trying to, to kind of move quickly through it. Um, I'm uh, looking in here. Hey. Hi, Sean. Hey, Chet. Oh, my God, Mikel. I, uh, John Coltrane's a great example. Like, when you're a kid and you hear Miles Davis or something like that, like, you're, like what kid is into that? Um, but you shouldn't be. We, our, our bodies crave harmony. If your body's craving dissonance at that point, like, that's, there's probably something wrong. I think that the... Um, the idea of resolution in music is something that kind of helps us uh, kind of metaphysically um, build our foundations as individuals. And then once you have a solid foundation, 
you can start to explore the dissonance. I definitely, I found this one guy made this resonate with me. Basically, a lot of people that I had met that did really disturbing artwork, musically and visually, were really, really great people. And one guy that I knew that was just, he was bipolar and one night like was slashing tires by an ex-girlfriend's house and just and that guy could only play the happiest 50s pop songs it was very weird and that was when i made the connection that for him to go near anything that was kind of beyond that really safe basket of security was really dangerous whereas the people that had kind of nice um stability in their foundation were able to explore it and you know i gotta say not just because you're here chat man i love that book that you sent to me it's a good example man you you got to be well adjusted to to go as far out as you went with that um so yeah so the dystopia book by chet Sar, if someone has not read it it's really really great i desperately would love to see movies and everything in that universe um, yeah, Leonard Cohen, man, he's the best. Also another Nick Drake, of course, but there's a guy named Bill Fay, F-A-Y, whoops, F-A-Y, that is worth putting the time in on. It's very, um, he's very spiritual, but he's got a song called Garden Song and Be Not So Fearful, I think is the title. Um, that are just masterpieces. And uh, yeah, I apologize about the scale of the Pater book. So Sean, you asked, um, what works on the occult shaped your perspectives on symbolism and Art Nouveau? Walden was a big one. Um, I think reading a lot about the young romantics like Keats and Shelley, um, it's not often what people think. There's definitely some Rosicrucian books, um, like The Mysteries of Osiris is a book that I had that, that, that did a lot. But I, I, found, I found most um, of kind of the expected occult literature to be... Um, to be a little self-important. And uh, the thing that made a 90 degree turn for me was when I made that connection that it's all nature. And it's kind of like maybe someone's trying to sell you a guitar. Oh, here's, this is a great example. I was going for piano lessons and the guy was trying to teach me like weird, like jazz versions of Mary Had a Little Lamb or whatever it was, I don't even remember, but like, you know, practicing really just kind of like banal, uh, expected, you know, local music store things. And I was like, ah, but I want to learn to play like Elton John. And so when I think about, like, it'd be like if you're looking at a great guitar and the person trying to sell it to you is playing like, I don't know, some kind of music that you can't stand. And so you're like, you can't wait to get that guitar into your hand to see what it would do with what you would do with it. And I think that my experience with a lot, and I have walls and walls and walls of bookshelves with occult literature. And so there are things that I get from everybody, but it's kind of like with art history books where there are ones that I, I get little bits, but there's not, there's only one book that I, well, actually, there's a few. I'll say those in a minute. But I think the main thing for me is when I got away from the occult thinking, and it was, it was walled, and it was recognizing the relationship with nature was the key to the lock, and that the rhetoric that people put over it was someone else playing the instrument and playing music that I didn't particularly like or agree with and then you start to get into their personal lives and you see okay well there's their ego and their self-importance and so um 
you know, and even if they don't have ego, well, now it's the absence of ego, which is an ego move onto itself. Like, it's just, it's, you know, it gets, and then there's people who want to be new age about it. And there's other people that want to have tons of diagrams because they feel that that complication is a validity. And again, it's like, man, it's all in a flower. Everything is there. Everything is, that's Walden. And so then the books that really, really made a difference to me were The Prophet by Hebron, um, Jonathan Livingston Seagull is a cliche, but it's beautiful poetry. Um, Prometheus Rising by Robert Anton Wilson was the one that really, really helped me the most. And so when I was starting to get into symbolism and Art Nouveau, for me, my interest in symbolism came from loving mythology. And then you start, I didn't understand the symbolism of mythology until I started understanding the symbolist paintings. And then I started looking at all these stories that I'd loved since I was a kid and understanding them in a more representational sense. Um, and the, uh, sorry, there's a police car outside. And it totally made me lose my thought. <laughs> um, so I will move on. Uh, Oh, but that's na the nature. And so that was the thing. So then the connection with nature made Art Nouveau fill uh, every crack of my, um, you know, where you could put adrenaline and excitement. Like it just felt to me everything I wanted to feel, whether it was spiritual or sexual or romantic or intellectual, any of it. Like I just did find all of it in, in Art Nouveau. Um, and so Brandon, Brandon's usually here running tech, but he's in New York. What would I recommend to someone getting into mysticism? Come on, man. We live in the same house, dude. I got a lot of books. Uh, like Chet said, the prophet, Jonathan Livingston Seagull, those are Bibles. Those are the real Bibles. Um, Chet, I don't know if you read the uh, book Illusions, which was kind of like a weird follow-up to Jonathan Livingston Seagull, uh, but Illusions was also a really good one. But again, the thing with people, then, you know, I found out years later, like the guy wasn't a great dad. So it's like, who knows? But the books are great. The prophet is great. Uh, I'm glad you liked Illusions. Yeah, that was a good one. There's another really great one called The Alchemist. Uh, is it by Paulo Coelho? Um, yeah, man. Illusions was same thing for me, man. All through high school, uh, I definitely carried Illusions, and that was that was it helped me make uh, make sense of my world, at least. Um, the other thing too, I can, can think of like in terms of, and this is going to resonate with, with the people that are here is, was also then discovering, I would almost say I, I discovered Art Nouveau before I knew it was Art Nouveau through people like Esteban Moroto and Michael Kaluta and, uh, Fine, you know, and, and to some degree, Charles Vest, but I think really the thing that kind of pushed my boundary the most was probably Esteban Moroto, um, in terms of like really having my map pushed out because it was so non Western in its sense of aesthetics, and the palettes were so psychedelic. I wasn't exposed to rock posters. Um, but those things, I, I was seeing those before I knew what Art Nouveau was. So I was seeing that, getting interested in mystical thinking and kind of had that platform where it's like, yeah, and, and 
in my world, this is what it looks like. And then, you know, you start reading things. And it's funny that we're talking here about Paulo Coelho and Richard Bach because everybody thinks that it's like, oh, do you like Aleister Crowley? And they talk about these things. And, and really, like, it was never that for me. Like, I've read, I've read the works now. Um, but it really was... Uh, I think that I just wasn't new agey enough to stay in the space of illusions and the alchemist. I think a lot of, I think that those are great entry points to expand thinking, but you don't want to just live in parable your whole life. You do want to have, um, you know, you want to, and, and reading Michael Moorcock and, and being able to really consider things like the multiverse, you know, I was probably, I don't know, 14 when I was reading about the multiverse. And, you know, I saw this thing with Michael Shannon talking about the multiverse. I don't know what that is. And it's like, man, I love him as an actor, but, you know, I don't know. I, I knew what it was when I was, before I, you know, I, was gonna, I guess I will say it. Say so before I had pubic hair, <laughs> but you know, so I don't know if that's a thing to be proud of. Like, you know, it's uh, it's great to have your mind expanded into the possibilities uh, of our universe and our lives. And um, uh, yeah, Anton LaVey was never, I just never, I never got into the, I, it all felt like pantomime to me when you start looking at occult thinking I mean, and I read a lot of crazy, crazy shit. Like, I remember reading the book 5-5-2000 and being convinced that on May 5th that the Earth was going to shift on its axis. Um, so as I've joked with Jason Louvre, like, I feel inoculated to conspiracy theories because of all the crazy shit that I bought into when I was a teenager. You know, none of which happened. And so you just kind of say, ah, someone can have these really great arguments and lots of uh, Mayan prophecy type things, and it doesn't mean anything. Um, yeah, five five two thousand man. I remember, I remember having a rough month around April that year. <laughs> Jupiter effect. I actually I don't know that one, but I am certain. Uh, if I look it up, that I'm going to laugh now. Um, there's a book called Timeless Earth that I loved. And my kid is getting into this kind of stuff now. And it talked about discs that they had that were like made out of jade and could be played like records. And all of these things, this book, Timeless Earth, was part of that Chariots of the Gods movement. And as an adult, when I read about this writer, like all of it's disproven and like he was describing things that didn't really exist, uh, you know, so it's not even like he just misinterpreted them. It was like he would say things that were just such far stretches and you couldn't fact check in the same way back then. But oh man, it was so good for my imagination. And I think that, you know, to kind of take it back to the the topic, I mean, isn't that why we're all interested in mysticism is because it represents that this physical world is the, whatever it is, you know, 10% of the iceberg that's above the surface and that we know that there's more. Um, and even if you don't believe in anything metaphysical, if it's just your internal thinking, if it's just the ways that those secret spaces move around each other in life. There's so much happening every minute, every millisecond, um, whether you're in a room filled with people or alone or driving in traffic or uh, in a negotiation or trying to build a business or a personal relationship. Um, and I think that contemplating alternate realities, contemplating the ways that sound and light work together, the ways that um, 
the ways that nature fuels our relationships with ourselves and with other people. Um, you know, this is another big thing in that's going to unfold in these Jugendstil books is that the Germans at the turn of the century, all of this metaphysical art that I was just showing you, that was super prevalent in Europe. Uh, the, the things that were more, that more geometric universe of things, things that were less aesthetic and more uh, intellectual. You had a lot of that in uh, Germany at the time. Actually, I'm going to show, let me see if I've still got it open. Here, I'll just do it here. Oh, it's on the back cover. So this artwork you might have seen, the woman floating with the Ouroboros serpent around her. That's an artist named Fidus. Fidus lived in Germany and was part of a, a, a movement called Lieben's Reform, a life reform. And they called them the nature mensch, the nature boys. Um, and culturally, these men and women would uh, be nudists, vegetarians, interested in mysticism, but mysticism in a, in a way dating back centuries, in a... Um, what's the word, not tribal, um, you know, d definitely more pagan in its, in its foundations. Um, and so they moved to California. There were a lot of German immigrants at the turn of the century. And so you have, so when we think of hippies and we think of California and we think of long hair and, you know, scantily clothed people, you know, doing uh, vegetarianism, you know, all of that. The idea that you would uh, make sure that you got a lot of sun because it's good for your health. Like, those are all German ideas that came over uh, with them, with the German immigrants bringing Lieben's reform to California specifically uh, in the 1890s. And so that, as these volumes continue... That is something that it's, it's mentioned in this one, um, but it's going to become really prominent in the ways that the art that we think of as psychedelic art uh, gets connected back to this 1896. I don't want to get off on too much of a tangent, but there was an exhibition in Berkeley in 1965 of German Jugendstil posters. And the artists that created the rock posters were all at that exhibition, saw the German posters where the text intermingled with the imagery. And so it is not an accident that the psychedelic art posters are all based on Jugendstil aesthetics. I mean, it is not, it is not an accident. There's a clear line, Germany to California in 1900, uh, and then the exhibition in 1965. Um, Chet is recommending Modern Occultism. I don't know that book. I feel like I know that name. But I'll check it out. I do. I read, I read a lot. Um, I just don't always agree with all of it. But I try to get as many perspectives as I can. And a lot of times what helps, and this is kind of interesting, I may be reading something like Anton LaVey or whatever, and you're reading and he's talking about something, and it might help me just, oh, this thing in a painting that I hadn't quite had click for me. So it's kind of funny. I feel like the art helps me understand the metaphysics, and the metaphysics writing helps me understand the art better. Um, oh, History of the Occult. It's modern occultism. Yeah, it sounds great. That sounds really cool. Uh, I definitely am a fan of learning about things like the Theosophical Society and um, the ways that that uh, these these movements kind of take root, which is why, which is why I'm not to, I'm not saying this to plug it, but that's the reason that I feel like this is so important. Um, is because it's so deeply connected to all of these things that we are all fans of. 
Um, and most people don't know the word Jugendstil at all, but they're all fans of it without realizing it. Um, I don't know what Rorik is. And I, I feel like I've heard the name Mitch Horowitz. I, I feel like I have. Um, there's eight minutes left. And uh, I don't know what to talk about. <laughs> How often does that happen? The occult history. I don't know that one either. The books that I was really, um, I was reading a lot of books on like encyclopedias of witchcraft and things like that, like Montague Summers. And I really liked more of the, uh, oh man, thank you so much, Chet. I, I really liked reading the stuff that was a little more ghost story-ish. So I liked the occultism as a, as a narrative element more than as like perhaps in a, a manner of thought. I was definitely in the Hammer Films universe with my uh, early exploration. Kat, you're in the room with me. Yeah. What are your principles of applying the principles of metaphysics what are your experiences of applying the principles of metaphysics to practical living as opposed to more academic rhetoric? Um, I think that the reason that I found, I found more helpful metaphysical thinking in a movie like Dead Poets Society than I did in stacks of occult books. Um, and I think that like these books that Sean just mentions, Encyclopedias of the Supernatural, Enchanted Lands, all of that stuff. I liked the idea of, of story and I liked the idea of magic and wonder and imagination and all of that. And then as I applied it to my own life, I found that the more that I looked into books on occult thinking, the more I felt like a rigid structure was being applied. And the reason that I liked the parables of things like Jonathan Livingston Seagull or the prophet is it was spiritual without being religious. And the reason that I liked books like uh, Prometheus Rising by Robert Anton Wilson is because they were pragmatic and practical without being um, stifling. It, it, it was like the more I learned about how my brain worked, the more it did liberate. And so I feel like it's kind of like when people say thoughts and prayers. I feel like if, if rituals and things like that, um, I shouldn't say if, rituals always help, but they don't have to be just traditional magical. It can be something as simple as carrying a photo of a loved one in your wallet. Like that is a magical act. That is an act of connecting with something outside of yourself with an intention to create a result. Um, and so I think that whatever it is that anyone does, whether it's a cult or metaphysical or um, and whether it's aesthetics or if it's literary, I think that the most important thing for anyone is that we're doing what we can to be the best versions of ourselves that we can be for the most people. And in a world where so many people are focused on material things like money and ego, 
um, you know, obviously that, that just, that doesn't, uh, doesn't take you very far. And so I just always looked to the things that were helping me to be mindful of what was the most important. And so, you know, when we're talking about Walden, and I'll go back to William Blake, and William Blake had that, that great line, to see a world in a grain of sand and heaven in a wild flower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. That, I mean, to be able to really have that resonate really resonate. I don't know if it ever has. I want it to, but I don't know if it has for me yet. Um, and so ultimately, you know, to me, it's all the only way to move closer to that is that kind of selflessness and um, self, um, self-sacrifice in, in service of community and whatever sense of spirituality any individual has. So I don't know if that answered your question, Kat. <laughs> Getting a thumbs up. But I wanted to give you a real answer. Because, um, yeah, it's easy to fall into the rhetoric. And uh, in the same way that saying thoughts and prayers after a tragedy are like, yeah, but what does that do? Like someone saying, oh, but I practice this kind of magical thinking and it's like yeah but you're an asshole like none of that it doesn't help like that's not the point I would rather be around someone that was just a, like a legitimately sincere person just trying to be as transparent and present as they could be I mean to me that's the most important thing in the world um there's uh some stuff in this chat that I'm going to look up because I don't know a lot of these names. But we are officially at 8.59. So with less than 60 seconds to go, I have wrapped up my soliloquy. Uh, I don't know what 2W4U, 2W4U, I don't know. I don't know. Schwaller de Lubitz, though, I'll, I'll look that up. And there's a bunch of stuff in here. I don't know what they are. Um, but I'll look all of it up. I really, really appreciate the recommendations. Um, but so thank you guys for being here. Uh, I don't know what we're going to do next month. There's a lot happening with books over the next two, three months. Um, Caligula is out. You've probably seen on my social media. I've been hanging out with Malcolm McDowell, who's amazing. Um, but so, uh, I don't know what we'll talk about next month, but I suspect it'll be literary. But so thank you for being here. If you guys are watching this or anyone is watching this um, later on YouTube, first Thursdays of every month, we do these. It's meant to just kind of recreate the experience of, of being in the gallery when we had it. Um, and now that we have moved into publishing, this is just kind of a way to, to try to stay present for everyone and in the community a little bit more. Um, but so thank you for being here and I'll see you the next first Thursday. Thank you so much.